Hi everyone, this is Alex here from Ninja Teacher and I'm joined by Kaylee from Expats Everywhere. Today we're going to talk a little bit about Kaylee's journey towards uh, teaching abroad and then moving on to uh, what she's doing now. So Kaylee, do you want to tell us what made you first want to live abroad? Sure, well thanks for having me Alex and uh, for me living abroad my family traveled a lot growing up that was nationally and internationally so I think I had just always really enjoyed the idea of travel and different cultures so when I was in college I wanted to do a study abroad somewhere but I couldn't find anyone to go with me and I'm the kind of person who I like doing that stuff but not alone I like to talk I like to experience things with other people and so the thought of doing it and going by myself at first and then meeting people I didn't like that idea that wasn't for me me, and I couldn't find anyone. My senior year, I met my um, who my husband is now, and he was talking about going abroad. So we, I said, just wait for me to graduate, and then we'll go. So he had wanted to do it. I wanted to do it. I had found someone who wanted to go with me. I was now older and adult. I could do it on my own, so I could choose where I wanted to go rather than just going with my family. And so for all of those reasons, I was ready just to experience other countries and cultures that I hadn't been to yet. Yeah, oh, that's great. And then the first place you went to teach was South Korea, right? It was actually Spain. I went ah, to yes. Spain and I taught a little bit there. Um, mm -hmm. I was an au pair, so I was a live-in nanny. But while I was there, I started getting into teaching a little bit private lessons only. I didn't work mm -hmm. for a company or a school, um, but I was in Spain and that's when I thought, I need to get more credentials for teaching before going to South Korea. So my first teaching job at a school was South Korea, but I kind of did a little bit of the education side of it and some uh, private lesson type things in Spain before going to South Korea. Right. And that was when you first got your TEFL certification. And was that an in-classroom course or online course? It was an online course. So we had decided okay. that we wanted to go to South Korea or go to Asia. That was the, the first thing. We had a few Asian countries in mind and I didn't have any experience with teaching uh, in a, an official capacity. And so that's when I said, I need to go ahead and get a TEFL. And I did an online course while I was still working. So it was fairly easy. I could still work and I could get that course or I could do that course online. Nice. And then you went to South Korea and what made you decide to go to South Korea and what was your first experience of it like? Well, we had never been to Asia and at this point my husband and I, we got married. So we were just dating in Spain and then we got married and decided we wanted to try Asia. We just wanted a totally different experience, different cultures. And we were looking at a few different countries. We were looking at South Korea, Japan and Malaysia. Um, my husband had more experience because he was doing, he did a master's in Spain for multicultural and bilingual education, but I didn't have any experience and I was going off of my TEFL. So um, as far as pay goes, uh, who was hiring at the time, it pretty much narrowed us down to South Korea, which was fine. It was one of the countries that we wanted to go to. Um, so we based ourselves there. And uh, I mean, it's a, just a very different culture, a very different country that we had ever been to. But experience wise, it was a lot of fun. Um, the people were so nice there. And uh, the TEFL definitely helped me get ready for uh, what was to come as far as teaching in school. So I was excited about at least having some sort of foundation. Um, but it was a different type of education than we, I would think, back in the States. And, and as I furthered my, um, I guess, my credentials, uh, I found out that there are different facets, I guess, of teaching and different ideas of what teaching looks like around the world. <laughs> Right, absolutely. So how long were you in South Korea and what were some of your top highlights of living there? So we were there for two years until we decided to move on to somewhere else. And I would say the food is really good. Um, now we're back in Europe and uh, my husband and I talk about all the time how we miss the food. So that was really good. Um, the people are really nice as well. So that was something that we that we liked. After a little bit, it gets tough because it's a bit of a homogenous country. And I know that you know about it because you've been there as well. But um, even though there are a lot of expats and there are a lot of foreigners there, um, it still is quite homogenous. And we lived in Busan, so even though Busan is the second largest city in the country and there are lots of foreigners, we found that the older population will still stare at you a lot. Um, like they've never seen you, which is weird because you walk around and you'll see expats or other people from different countries all the time. But I think towards the end of our stay there, uh, I was getting a little annoyed with like, the staring because you live there and you want to assimilate and you want to be part of, of the country, but you're getting stared at like you are a foreigner. So that was a little tough. But I would say that um, when you get to know people, they're really nice. 
and accommodating and they want to have you over and they have just amazing food. <laughs> yeah, I miss the kimbap and kimchi and so much stuff from South Korea and you just can't get good South Korean food outside of South Korea, I've, I've found at least. You can't and I like a few of the more obscure type dishes and so those are just really hard to get outside of Korea and if you do find a Korean place, they'll have some of this stuff but like you said, it's not as good and it's expensive. That's the thing that really stinks is you're used to paying really uh, inexpensive prices for that type of food in Korea and you, you, know, you want that type of food but it's like, oh, I don't want to pay three times as much for it you know right i saw some people that left vietnam recently where you can get a bowl of pho for like two dollars here and they paid twenty dollars in the states <laughs> clearly after living there you did want to carry on living abroad and also um, i know you carried on with your getting further qualifications with teaching so what were your thought processes about that did you want to just carry on uh, living abroad and you thought you could get uh, better jobs and stuff if you've got if you got further qualifications yeah, that's exactly why we ended up getting further qualifications because we wanted to continue this lifestyle and we found that teaching was the way to do it. And we wanted to try out different countries and base ourselves in different locations around the world. And the higher paying jobs, the better paying job, or the, just the better jobs in general, tended you need to have a little bit more than a TEFL. So what we did is while we lived in Korea, we did an online program to get state certified in the States. So we have our state license. So it's actually a license that we could, if we wanted to teach in the U.S., we could teach. That's what's required at the public school system there. So we needed that so that we can get into international schools. So we, w we did an online program there, which worked out really well because since we were teaching in a school, our practicum, that it qualified for that. So we just had to have one of our teachers be our mentor teacher and sign off on things, write notes and just observe us, that type of stuff. But um, we were already full on teaching anyway, so it was quite easy because you knew exactly what you were doing. So we went through this program online, everything was online and it took about a year and, and then we got state certified. So kind of just leveling up i guess you could say as we as we went so that we could get uh better jobs yeah that's great and then uh after that you decided to go live in a different country right what was the process like and how did you pick your next country so the next country was saudi arabia after south korea and I would say that we didn't necessarily pick it. It picked us in a sense. Uh, you know, my husband wanted to go to the Middle East. We hadn't traveled there. We hadn't been anywhere there. And he was kind of feeling at the time too, like media was telling you this is what you should think of that region of the world. And he was like, I want to go there and I want to experience it myself. And I want to talk to the locals and, and see for myself, make my own, uh, you know, opinions and, and everything. So I said, okay, let's go to the Middle East. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But anywhere but Saudi Arabia, because it was, you know, one of the most closed <laughs> off countries at the time still kind of is so I said anywhere but Saudi Arabia long story short we ended up there because we had jobs in Dubai but there were some red flags that came up with that and so we said okay we shouldn't do this and a good job came up in Saudi around the same time and so we ended up going there so we actually taught at a university there and even though our state licenses were for K to 12 it still um, helped having that credential helped us get those jobs uh, for university because it was a type of job that they had to uh, it was in English of course but they had to pass this it was like 18 19 year olds that came into university they had to pass this for them to get into certain fields so if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer uh, some of those uh, higher fields that English was required they had to pass this type of English course um, before getting into that field and continuing their education so it was a university in Saudi Arabia Okay, nice. Yeah, I don't have much experience in the Middle East myself. And I do know, though, that a lot of people go there for some high paying teaching jobs. And what was the experience like there? And did you find the pay was also higher there? Yes, the pay is definitely higher there, and that was one of the reasons that we wanted to go because um, my husband, he has an MBA as well in the U.S., and he had some student loan debt from that, from that master's. So, uh, and it was almost done, and we just thought, let's go ahead and, and you know, go there, wipe that out. And we had some other financial goals just for saving and buying properties and stuff. So we said, let's just, you know, see about doing this for a year. Um, and it's true. Like, you, you are able to make a lot of money and save a lot of money. That's the other thing, um, especially in Saudi Arabia because – everything it tends to be paid for. We lived on a compound, groceries and such, they're 
quite inexpensive because the government uh, subsidizes them, so they're inexpensive for everyone. So you're able to save a lot, and then you're also able to travel a lot, which is really nice. So that was another cool thing about being there is um, we could experience more of the region outside of Saudi as well. Our jobs gave us a lot of uh, vacation time too. So just the way that it worked out, we were able to see a lot. But while we were there, uh, the job was fairly fairly easy, uh, straightforward. The curriculum was set out for us, so you didn't have to do too much. You could supplement as you wanted, but the books were already there because it was a university, so they had certain books that we had to use. And then we lived on a compound, and on the compound, it's all foreigners. So life on the compound is quite normal, um, and it varies. Our compound was smaller, so it was a bit more like a neighborhood, but there are compounds there that are like their own city. So ours was like, you know, we had a pool, we had a soccer field, we all had housing, there was like a clubhouse that you could hang out, there were parties at and stuff, and you could walk around freely, no problem, um, on the compound. And then it was a little different when you're off, you have to, the women have to be covered up, and you don't walk as much. I guess you have, uh, especially where we were in the eastern province, you have a driver, um, just because it's not common to go places and stuff, so a bit more spread out anyway, and it's hot, so, um, right. so... That experience was fine. Um, it, I, at the time we were there, it's a little different now. Stuff's opened up a bit more now, but it's just the main thing was it just got a little boring, I guess you could say. There just wasn't much mm. to do. We had a, a gym too, so a lot of people just, I mean, I was, I was probably the best shape I've ever been in. <laughs> You're kind of just nice. working it out because it gives you something to do. And But yeah, so it was a good experience. It, it was a little hard to meet the locals because of the type of lifestyle that you live. You could choose to live off the compound, but that's also difficult. Um, but when you do meet the locals, they're just, they're very kind people. Um, they know a lot about the U.S. A lot of them um, have studied in the U.S. They've got family members in the U.S. And so they're just very, very nice people and they want to show you their culture. And I think because they know that um, sometimes the media or other, um, other avenues are maybe not showing them in the best light and they want to show you uh, their, their culture. So mm. um, they're very kind people. A lot of people that are interested in teaching and starting out with ESL and TEFL are curious about this ability to carry on and get uh, you know a teaching license and teach in international schools and abroad in different countries at international schools and up their pay so it's uh, nice to speak to you to get an example of this um, and i know after this you went to singapore right and how was that Yes. So we went to Singapore. We had actually visited Singapore while living in Saudi. And the first day we were there, we were like, this is the next place. We loved it so much. It was so beautiful. And uh, we actually found our jobs that night in the hotel just on a search portal um, for teaching. And that one was an international school. So because we were able to beef up our resumes, get those different credentials, um, experience, we were able to work at an international school there. So that was a completely different experience than all the other places had been. Right. And what was the job difference like? So that one, it was an American international school. So it's pretty much run as I would say like a private school would be in the U.S. So I was an ESL teacher there. At that time, uh, my husband, he had to do one other course to um, add to his state license to become the PE teacher. So because when we looked for jobs, there was only one ESL job available, and but they were um, hiring for PE and he had a background in coaching. So they were like, okay, if you can add that to your, your cert, you know, certification, then um, you know, we can hire you for that job. So we did that and it's just, it's completely different because it's just run the way that like a public school would be. Whereas for example, in Korea, as the ESL teacher, you're kind of like an assistant. So there's a Korean teacher in there and you only do the English classes and, and I only would see certain classes on certain days, so not every day, um, sometimes only once a week. And you tend to be the fun teacher where you're playing games and, and you're doing the fun parts of them learning English. Right. As opposed to at an international school, you are the teacher. So you have to hit certain standards, you have to test them. Um, it, it's just very different. So it's as if you're on, you know, in Korea, you're the fun game you know, teacher but then in an in international school it's going to be as if you're teaching any other subject math science you know you have to teach them and they have to pass that class so it, it's actually very different got it and Singapore I've visited it before it looks like a city from the future it is incredible uh, what did you like about living in Singapore 
Oh, we love Singapore, and they've come a long way in a very short time um, with their history, which is pretty cool. But it's very clean. It's very safe. You can find anything that you want there. A lot of people will say, oh, I hear that Singapore is really expensive, and there are parts of it that are expensive. For example, housing is it can be expensive, and a lot of that is due to space. But you can go to, they have these things called hawker centers, which is kind of like you would think of it as like a street stalls, but they're permanent, and they're regulated by the government so that they're clean. So that means that they go in and they make sure that they're following code. Um, so that's also something that's really nice. And these hawker centers are all over the place and it's the local food. Well, the local food is quite mixed because of their short, I guess, history. They've got the Chinese influence, they've got the Indian influence, Indonesian, so a lot, of, and Malay, of course. So all of these countries that are around them, have they have people there that are um, are locals and that are now and that are Singaporeans, so they're making this different type, you know, these different types of foods, and um, you can, these are very inexpensive. So we used to eat out at these every day for lunch. So you would think, whoa, you know, Singapore is so expensive, but you're eating out every day. Well, you can get full on a full plate of meal, really good food for just a couple dollars, and and you're set. Now, if you want to have you know a nice burger, a drink, you know, alcohol is expensive because it's taxed really high, um, but you can, I mean. In Anything to the moon really is what you can spend on food there. So there's quite a range, but you can definitely live there in an inexpensive way or you can go all out. Um, but we really love Singapore just because there's, even though it's a small island, there's just so much to do on the island. And it's pretty well connected to the countries around them. Uh, Changi Airport is has for years been the number one airport in the world because it's so beautiful. There's so many things to do. It's got, you know, like a movie theater and you can get a massage and there's a slide and there's all these yeah. crazy things that you could do. You know, people go and spend like the day at the airport because there's so many things you can do. So I just think that Singapore has done a really good job of making it beautiful. It does have some elements of, you know, being futuristic, but it's beautiful. It's clean. It's safe. Um, so just a lot of great aspects of Singapore. We really liked it there. And then after Singapore, uh, I think that's right that you moved to Portugal, right? Where you are now. Yes. Um, yes. And so. do you want to tell us a little bit about that and then transition into what you're doing now with expats everywhere? Sure. So way back when we started, when we lived in Spain, we visited Portugal. Uh, specifically, Porto was one of our favorite cities. And we just, we really liked it. At that time, Americans didn't really know much about Portugal. So we used to call it the hidden gem because when Americans would think of Europe, they'd go to London, Paris, Rome, maybe Barcelona. But a lot of people didn't even know where Portugal was or they thought it was part of Spain. So we would love to go there because it was just such a nice place. Uh, it wasn't overrun by loads of tourists. I mean, the Brits would come but more in the south and so we just really like Porto because uh, it was it was a city it has a river and it has a beach so it just seemed to have everything and we said one day we would love to live in Porto so while, while we were in Singapore we had been you know teaching for a while and neither one of us had actually gone to school for teaching I went to school for psychology and like I said earlier my husband has an MBA in business and so along the way actually while we were in Saudi we had started a company called expats everywhere and the reason, two reasons for that, when you're in Saudi, like I was saying, there's not too much to do, so everyone kind of seems to find a hobby or something that they right. can do. We were getting ready to move, and it was, again, you know, you got to fix your CV, you've got to, you know, go through all the application process, and, you know, it's always daunting when you have to do that again. And Josh, my husband, said, I would pay someone to do this. And so we thought, well, if we would pay someone to do this, maybe other people would pay for this type of maybe consulting or just this kind of help. And so we started the, our YouTube channel to get information out about the business, which was just mainly going to be consulting. And since then, it's definitely shifted. But as we were in Singapore, we, we had expats everywhere. And it was mainly not a hobby, but kind of a side business. It's really hard to grow something when you both have full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. And so towards the end of our time there, we, we were just chatting that it would be great if one of us could go into expats everywhere full-time and see if it would, you know, what it could be uh, if we're actually putting more time and effort into it. And at that time, I was able to find a remote job. And this is before, you know, working remotely was a big thing. But uh, I was able to find a remote job. So 
we decided, okay, let's go ahead and try this. I'll, you know, bring the income in with the remote job and Josh, you can further expats everywhere. And since then, um, it's grown a lot. It's, it's changed. Now it's mainly a uh, media content creation company. We do have the consulting and everything, but YouTube is our biggest thing with our channel and just getting information out to people who want to live abroad in any sort of way. Like if you want to retire or if you want to teach or if your company's sending you, um, but you're not sure about the country, uh, and you want to learn someone lives in that country, like, you know, you live in Vietnam and you share your experience about what it's like in Vietnam. We want to put that on our channel so other people can watch that and be like, okay, this gives me an idea of what to expect. I think I could live there or maybe it's not for me. So that's kind of what expats everywhere uh, has turned into and it's given us a chance to live in Portugal because Portugal has a really good, uh, it's called a D7 visa that you can live off of passive income and for the, a long time people thought it was just you could only retire here but if you have work and you and you make money in different capacities even with a contract and then passive income because we have investments we're able to get the visa to live here in Portugal. Oh that's great yeah I think your content is really helpful because that is a big thing when people are planning to move abroad they just want more information they want to see what different countries are like and getting uh, perspectives from different people is very helpful. Even people that haven't signed up through Ninja Teacher for a program or anything, I've, I just meet people out and about sometimes that were like, we watched your videos and it was really helpful. Thank you, you know? So anyone who's watching this, definitely go check that out. If someone wanted to get a hold of you, where can they go? Sure, so our YouTube channel is Expats Everywhere. And then you can, of course, email. We have a couple email addresses, but mine is info at expatseverywhere.com. And we're on, you know, Instagram, Facebook, all of that stuff expats everywhere so just find us there great well thanks for chatting to us kaylee and uh yeah everyone should definitely go check out your channel and uh yeah great to talk to you thanks for having me 